heart and then ask God to move in a special way in the invitation tonight. Brother Kelly, God bless you. Good to have you at Tabernacle. Thank you, preacher. And good to be back tonight. I've been rejoicing in my heart uh, all day long. I enjoyed last night, been with God's people, and shouting the victory. Sometimes you get in a jam. I was up in uh, Burnsville, North Carolina, last summer in the camp meeting there. I've been going there for several years. And this old fella started at the town on Saturday morning in his old pickup truck. And that rattle trap thing was going down the road and all of a sudden he looked and there was uh, the highway patrol had a roadblock set up. Well, the old fella didn't have his seat belt on and so he went to get in hold of that thing and finally got it all hooked up. The patrolman checked his license and said to him, uh, you wear your seat belt often? Oh Lord, he said, every time I leave the house I buckle up. <laughs> well, he said, you always run it through the steering wheel. <laughs> I mean, boy, you can get in a jam sometime, can't you, huh? I tell you, I've been just meeting. I ain't been no jam here. I've been enjoying it, having a good time in the Lord night after night. And I appreciate this good crowd, good group of people tonight meeting in the house of the Lord. Let me say just a word about the camp meeting. Brother Mays Jackson, Brother Tom Hayes, Mays and Hayes, they'll be there again this time. Brother Mays will be preaching the first week, Brother Hayes second week, and also Brother Canoy will be there in the morning time, second week, teaching at 10 o'clock every morning. It'd be worth your time, if you could, to just hear Brother Canoy teach every morning. I'll tell you, he'll be a blessing to you. Come be in the services if you can. And then on the 4th of July, we're going to do it again. Amen. We're going to barbecue about 500 chickens. I don't have many hogs. We'll have you cackling or squealing one or the other. Yes, sir. All that good old macaroni pie. We're going to eat it. Amen. Man. Yes, sir. We're going to have a time. Somebody said, well, you do that every, every year? We've been doing it for a long time. And we're going to get out them baked beans and all the uh, uh, slaw and the uh, uh, lemonade barrels. Did I ever tell you here, I've told this all over the country, but I don't know whether I've told it in Tabernacle or not. Some years ago, I said to an old fellow, I said, do you have a wooden barrel that we could make some good old-fashioned lemonade? Now, I'm not talking about this country time stuff and, and uh, stuff you buy in the package. I'm, I'm not a package fella. I like that real stuff. It takes two. 200 lemons and 65 pounds of sugar per barrel. So this old fellow said, you got a barrel. Yeah, he said, I got one. He brought it to me, but he didn't tell me where it was from. Jack Daniels Distillery over in Tennessee. Happy Burns and myself, we knocked the top out of that thing. Charcoal was that deep on the inside. Took us a half a day to get it cleaned up. Finally, I washed it out and I made lemonade. And folks said it was undoubtedly the best they'd ever drank in all their life. In fact, to tell you the truth, we had more shouting that afternoon we did that morning. And so I went back. I got five more of them barrels. Y'all come on out. Last year, last year we had five 55-gallon barrels of lemonade. And I think we had about a 1,000 lemons squeezed up, and we just had a time. And you come on this time. Be with us. Now, I'm sure the Lord will bless you in a special kind of way. Help us pray that we'll be able to get the roof on that building soon. I don't know how soon. We just operate as we get money. And uh, somebody said, well, hurry up. Well, give me the money. I'll do it tomorrow if you give me the money. Amen. And that's what it takes. And by the way, I don't know what all the offer may be, but uh, Brother Clark, Church, I appreciate every dime of money that you've given to us in these days. And may the Lord bless you for uh, putting forth money, and we'll get the roof on that thing as soon as we can. And praise God, I'm, I'm, I'll be glad when we can have services all the time there at the camp meeting ground year-round. Be wonderful where folks can come out and be with some services there uh, just every week. I was up in Elyria, Ohio one time, and there's an old fellow up there had a camp, and he had it year-round. I never heard that before. You say, how'd he do it? Well, on Saturdays during school weeks, he'd have as high as 500 kids there every Saturday. And he'd uh, 
feed, well, he'd get uh, six to 12 year olds, uh, from about eight o'clock till three o'clock that afternoon, feed them a meal, and then he'd go and unload those and, and pick up the teenagers. They had a big crowd of teenagers that come in, stay till nine o'clock that night, and he'd feed them a meal. Well, he said, I was going in the hole. He said, uh, feeding all that crowd, about 500, and he said, the crowd is too big anyhow. And so I decided I'd charge him a dollar a head and see if that wouldn't defray some of the expenses on the food. And so he said I charged him a dollar, but he said it didn't hurt the crowd a bit. said they just kept coming. And he said, I got to thinking about it. Where could you get a babysitter all day Saturday for a dollar and feed them a meal on top of it, huh? So anyhow, uh, we're hoping to have a time where we can have young people in there. I'll, I'll be glad we can get a, a gymnasium out there where if it's bad weather, we can meet on the inside. And listen, we're, we're here in a strategic area. Uh, they built camps all over this country uh, that uh, we should have had here a long time ago. I mean that. We should have had a camp that I've got in mind right here in this area. We're in the heart of the Bible Belt. And somebody said Greenville, South Carolina is a belt buckle. Well, that's about it. And uh, we should have a place uh, where we could have all kinds of activities going on at all times for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in the camp meeting. Somebody said, what's the purpose of a camp meeting? Well, it's a good place for God's people to find out the direct will of God for their life. You'd be surprised how many folks have been uh, to camp meetings and even here in Greer. I can name a lot of preachers that surrendered uh, to go to the foreign mission fields and folks that answered the call to preach and, and it came to the camp meeting out at Greer. And you pray that God will help us. And we're just going to have a time this time. Now, if you like an old-fashioned meeting, you'll enjoy that. If you don't like it, stay at the house. Amen. Because we're going to keep it that way. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I like it. I like to see folks. I don't, hey, I don't believe in just uh, working up something. But, brother, if it comes down from heaven, I tell you, let the devil get out of the way. I'm going to have myself a time. Amen. And I mean that. I think uh, uh, camp meeting's got its place. And it doesn't take the place of the church. It's not fighting the church. It's working with the churches in this area. And so you pray and come out to the camp if you possibly can. And may the Lord bless you. Where's the musicians, please? All right. And I'll uh, sing a song tonight. It's been, I've had several requests. Can't sing them all. <clears throat> I sung one at Benny's uh, wedding that I'll never get over. I'd never forget that one. He wanted me to sing, I'd rather have Jesus. <laughs> I said, what are you getting married for? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw that before. <laughs> That's a good. I'm going to take my coat off tonight. I like to burn up while it's not. And I ain't going to do that no more. <clears throat> How many have been here every night? Lift your hat. Hold it up. Look up there. Boy, that's a good crowd. Amen. Hey, let me make this announcement. Start a meeting tomorrow night in Williamston, South Carolina. Brother Jim Norris. Is that faith? Trinity. 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 I'll get them mixed up. Trinity Baptist Church down at Williamston, South Carolina. If you can, come down and be with us. And if you can't, keep them cards and letters are coming. Amen. Yes, sir. Make sure it's a letter because you can't put nothing in the card. All right. Bring it down and with us if you can at the Greer Baptist camp meeting this year and tomorrow night at the meeting. We're just going to have a time. I like to go to meetings all the time. I go all the time. In fact, sometimes I don't even know where I am half of the time. I meet myself a coming back. And I'm a getting old. You know how to tell, Brother Truax? I was looking at you a while ago, and I thought to myself, now we're somewhere about the same age. You know how you tell when you're getting old, when you drop something, and you bend over, and look around and see if there's anything else needs to be done while you're down there. <laughs> that's how to tell when you're getting old. And I must be getting old. And, I was at the mailbox today, and I didn't know whether I was going out there to get the mail or, or was taking something out there. I just, hey, it's getting bad. I don't know whether I'm going up the steps or just come down. I can't figure the deal out. Prodigal son, in it. Like the prodigal son, I wandered in darkness. I traded my life for a world.
up to greet me. I'm willing to be as a servant for thee. Like the prodigal son, I wandered in darkness, but the shepherd sought me. Through the heat and the cold The mighty at night He left in the pole To find his lost sheep That was hungry and cold So I believe I'll go home And be with the Father have your Bible. Turn with me tonight for just a few minutes to 1 Kings and chapter 14. I'm sorry, 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. I'll be like the fellow that's been married seven times. I'm not going to keep you too long tonight. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 13, reading in verse 14. 1 Kings chapter 13 and in verse 14. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came us from Judah? And he said, I am. Now as you look at this portion of God's word tonight, you'll find and, uh, my friends, that uh, Jeroboam is fixing to put a golden calf in Dan and the other in Bethel, and he makes an excuse why he is putting these golden calves out. He said it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem to worship. Now, in the Bible, Jerusalem is a type, uh, a shadow of a true place of worship. You remember how that the man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho? He went down not only spiritually, but went down geographically. Jericho's the the lowest city on the face of this earth. It's over 400 feet below sea level. And notice, my friends, this man went down. At any time that you leave uh, Jerusalem in your life, the true place of worship, you're headed for trouble. And my friends, the devil always has an excuse for you to leave, to get out, get away from the true place of worship. So he said, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, and I'm going to put a golden calf in Dan and the other one in Bethel. Now, instead, you'll find uh, that he or, uh, sanctions a certain month, I believe it was the month of November, on the 15th day of the month, he said uh, uh, he was going to have his big uh, uh, celebration of putting the golden caves out. And so, my friends, that day finally comes. Now, by way of introduction, I want you to look in chapter 12, uh, and at about verse 31, I believe it is, uh, uh, verse 31, and he made a house of high places, uh, and made priests of the lords of the people, which were not the sons of Levi. Now, before this big feast starts, and, and before he He's going to have his big celebration. He gets some of the lowest men in the kingdom, and he makes priests out of them. They were not of the uh, seed of the Levi, the following the, the steps of Levi, but my friends, they were the lowest people in the kingdom. It must have been the drunks, the thugs, uh, and what have you. And the scripture said that he made priests out of them, uh, and now then uh, the big day of celebration comes. Uh, oh, I can see folks gathering from everywhere. Here comes a tremendous crowd. Wait a minute. If you watch the crowd, uh, you may land up in hell, my friend. You may go with the crowd, but you may go wrong. Somebody said of America's leading evangelist, uh, he must be of God. Uh, he has a crowd. Uh, well, they got crowds at the supermarkets. Uh, the ball stadiums are packed. Uh, I tell you, friends, you go down here to the uh, wrestling matches. Go where you will. Great big crowds, but that doesn't mean that God is in a million miles of that place. huh? And so, my friends, the crowd gathers in. No doubt there was ever thing in the crowd. Uh, here comes the gooses and the mooses and the hoot owls and all the lodge halls. Uh, Why well, they name all those things after animals? I never figured that deal out. But here comes all the lodge halls. Uh, here comes the religious folks. Uh, hey, everybody's gathered 
in. And about that time, the crier steps up, and he, he silences the crowd, uh, and he introduces Jeroboam to the crowd. Jeroboam steps forth, and as he does so, the Bible said, uh, he went to burn incense uh, upon the altar. Just as he does so, something happened. And that brings us now to chapter 13 and verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And notice this man cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born uh, to the house of David, Josiah, the name, and upon uh, thee shall he offer the priest of the high places uh, that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Now, my friends, get the scene. Jeroboam steps up to burn incense, and all of a sudden, you never heard such hollering all your life. Here comes a man of God. The Bible said he cried out against the altar in the word of the Lord. Notice he was God's man. Don't you like that? He was mama called, daddy pulled, uh, nor the dominational plucked. Uh, you're welcome. He was God's man. And I want to say this tonight as emphatically and as dogmatically as I can. I think that God's man ought to demand uh, and command every situation, my friend. I believe that with all of my heart. I see some of these little mealy mouth, back scratching, compromising, ear tickling, pussyfooting, mud hole wallet, cigarette sucking, poodle dog tearing preachers uh, that talk so soft they sound like they got a budget on their tongue uh, and a hearty on their lung uh, and they never command anything. Is that right? But that's what's God's man. Uh, God's man, my friends, is a shepherd uh, and not a sheep dog. Uh, that's right. God's man, I was telling Brother Clark a while ago, he ought to learn to let his motor idle. That's right. Yes, sir. It's not what you're eating that's hurting you. It's what's eating you. Isn't that right? A lot of people, I tell you, have never learned to depend upon the Lord. But here was God's man, uh, and he was a shepherd uh, and not a sheep dog. Uh, and he steps on the scene uh, and he commanded the situation and he cried out against the altar in the word of the Lord. Now when he did so, the Bible said the altar rent, the ashes blows up, the smoke gets in Jeroboam's face uh, and he got mad. Uh, that's right, he got mad. I guess it made me mad. Boy, listen, Jeroboam threw his arm out and said, Lee, hold on that man. And the Bible said uh, that his arm dried up uh, and he couldn't get it down. Now, one of you stupid looking things standing there with his arm out and he couldn't get it down. I mean, he couldn't get his arm down. Now, the Bible said it dried up and he couldn't get it down. Now, if I'd have come through that door tonight with my arm sticking out, no doubt you folks that really know me, you'd say, Let's get, look at that crazy thing. He'll do anything to get a life. You'd have probably said that. Well, I want to tell you, Jeroboam's not putting on. I mean, his arm's dried up. You know what he done? He turned to the man of God uh, and he said, Entreat the face of the Lord thy God uh, and pray for me. Wait a minute. Why did he turn to those lowly priests uh, that he'd made, the men that he'd made priests, my friends, drunkards, uh, whoremongers, and what have you? Why didn't he turn to that crowd? The same reason that a bootlegger doesn't turn to a bunch of puking drunks uh, when he's a dying. He turns, uh, my friends, to those uh, that has power with God. Uh, and so he turned and he said, Entreat the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me. And so what happened? The man of God prayed for him. And the Bible said when he did so, a Jeroboam's arm was made whole again. And he said to the man of God, come and go home with me. I want to give you a gift. Uh, and he said, I wouldn't go home with you if you'd give me half your kingdom. Uh, boy, he wasn't a Baptist, was he? Huh? Say amen right there. He said, uh, for it was charged to me by the word of the Lord that I shouldn't eat, uh, I shouldn't drink, uh, not go back the way I came. Uh, so he dismisses himself, and the scripture says uh, that he went out of town uh, in another direction. Uh, now then that day down at that meeting, there were some old boys, listen to me, their daddy was an old prophet, he was backslidden on the Lord, uh, he stayed at the house that day, he didn't go out, but the boys went out. About milk and time, they got home, uh, and they said to their father, you should have been with us today. 
My man said, listen, I have something unusual happen. Said Jeroboam got up to burn incense on the altar and said, there's a man come out of the crowd of preaching. You never heard such hollering and going on in all your life. Said he's a frothing at the mouth. He is screaming against the altar and said, you know, that thing rent ashes got in Jeroboam's face and smoke. It made him mad and said he put his arm out and they said, Pap, his arm dried up uh, and he couldn't get it down. And said he called on the man of God to pray for him and said he prayed for him and said his arm was made whole once again. And then the old preacher looked at his sons and he said to them, uh, what way went he? Uh, they said he went in a certain direction. And so the Bible said the old man turns to these fellows uh, and he said, Twam, you go saddle up the ass. Uh, and the Bible said he went after the man of God. Now that brings me to verse 14. Look at it again. And went after the man of God and found him sitting uh, under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came us from Judah? And he said, I am. Now notice, my friends, uh, this old preacher goes after the man of God. Where did he find him? He found him sitting uh, under a big oak. Uh, what's wrong with the big oak? Not a thing. Why, that big oak tree makes uh, a shade for the weary traveler. It, my friends, makes protection for the traveler, for the animals. Uh, it, my friends, bears fruit. Uh, well, one of the finest oaks are in this part of the world is the white oak. The animals love white oak acorns. The bears eat white oak acorns. The deer, the coons, uh, the turkeys, the wild animals. I enjoy the white oak acorn. And boy, I tell you, listen, nothing wrong with a big shade tree. But I'll tell you, my friends, there's something wrong when God's man's looking for a quitting place, huh? Yes, sir. You see, neighbor, he gets under this big oak tree and he's fixed to quit uh, on God. Uh, hey, somebody he said the other day, when you're going to retire, there's no place for God's man to retire. Hey, I might get to where I'm physically uh, unable to go. But I'll tell you, as long as God gives me breath, it's my solemn duty. I to preach the gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no retiring place. Uh, well, I want to tell you, my friends, here, here's this man sitting under the old tree. And uh, he's, he's uh, got him a big jug of lemonade, baby. Boy, he's taking it easy. He's sending himself. I just had a big healing campaign. Uh, Jeroboam got healed. Uh, maybe he's writing to the religious papers about his big campaign. Uh, and all of a sudden, here comes this old preacher riding up. Are you listening to me? And the Bible said, uh, my friends, this old man said to him, said, I'm a man of God, as you are. And uh, he said, uh, uh, an angel spake to me. Let me read it to you. Verse 15. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not go with thee, nor go in with thee that thou uh, knew I'll eat bread or drink water with thee in this place. Uh, for it was uh, said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water uh, there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Uh, now he brings his message, uh, and his message is, God told me not to go back the way I came. He told me not to eat, not to drink, uh, but to go out of town in another direction. He preaches his message. Well, wait a minute, friend. Uh, when your back's been on God, when you're uh, quitting on God, when you find your big oak somewhere and trying to rest on God, I want to tell you a little preaching doesn't mean a hill of beans, my friend. You can preach all, the, all you want to. You can have as strong convictions you want to. But when you've gone back on God, your sermon, your message uh, just doesn't affect folks. Uh, and so this old preacher said, why, I'm a preacher like you are. And an angel spake unto me. Look at it. In verse 17, for it was said unto me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread. Verse 18, he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me, um, by the word of the Lord and saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he eat bread and drink water. But notice what it said. But he lied unto him. Now I want to tell you, my friends, tonight, listen, there is such a thing as a lying preacher. You believe that, huh? You better believe me tonight. When I first started out preaching 41 years ago in Knoxville, Tennessee, I thought everything that had a Bible under its arm uh, was called a preach. Uh, I soon found out that wasn't right. No, sir. Not like the story 
story. The old man and woman that had a child late in life. And uh, so when he got up old enough, they they're going to try to make something out of him. The old man said, Mama, let's put him in a room with a table. And on the table, we'll put an apple. We'll put a dollar bill and we'll put a Bible. If he picks up the apple and eats it, we'll make a farmer out of him. If he picks up the dollar and puts it in his pocket, we'll make a banker out of him. And if he picks up the Bible, uh, we'll make a preacher out of him. Uh, well, they put him in the room. Uh, and after a while, they went in, and there's the old boy. He'd eat the apple, had the dollar in his pocket, and the Bible under his arm. And the old man said, Mama, we'll have to make a politician out of him. Ah, hey! Well, I want to tell you, my friend, listen. Uh, this man, uh, uh, this man, uh, uh, everything that tears a Bible is not called a God. I tell you, there's some counterfeiters uh, on the face of this earth. When you turn your radio on, listen to me now. When you turn your radio on and you hear some fella come on like this, repent and get baptized uh, uh, for the remission of say, hey, hey, he, I'm telling what he, way he talks. He's a water dog. Uh, that's what he is. Uh, yes, sir. He talks about water all the time. Hey, he never preaches about the blood. If I believe not save a water tonight, I'd never sing about the blood. I'd never preach about the blood. I'd take every song, book, and thing about the blood and get rid of it. I'd take the Bible, send thing about the blood, I'd get rid of it. You know what it's saying? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the water. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the water. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the water fountain. I'd sing that. I'd never sing at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light. I'd sing at the meal pond at the meal pond where I first got ducked. I'd never sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I'd sing Amazing Baptism, how sweet the splash. If I save the water, I'm not saved the water. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. It's the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. Now you tell these liars when they come on, and my friends, they tell you you got to get baptized to go to heaven. Uh, one woman wrote me a letter some time back, and she said, what you need is a new tongue. I wrote her back, what you need is a good bridle to go on one you got. Amen. Yes, sir. Well, I want to tell you one thing tonight. Listen, bless God you come to this book tonight. I want to tell you, my friends, uh, how we look at there is such a thing as lying preachers. Uh, I heard a preacher on the radio some time back, and he said there's no such thing as a burning hell. He said it's an old English word that's spelled H-E-L. And he said it's nothing but a dark hole in the ground. Now, he said when we was boys, he said we used to dig potatoes. And he said my daddy and my grandpa would have us to put those potatoes in hell, a dark hole in the ground. I said to the preacher friend that was listening to the broadcast with me, I said, uh-huh, God sticks him in hell. He'll come out a baitator. Amen. Now, I want to tell you, the Bible said it's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Is that right? Yes, sir. Come on now. Listen, my friends, there is such a thing as lying preachers. Uh, I'm dead on to confess my sins through a knot hole. Uh, the Latin speaking, rule word, beat town priest to call father. The bird ain't even married. This is like mum on top of it. Uh, hey, I'm glad, thank God, I came to Calvary one day. Uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, washes uh, my sins away. Uh, I went to the United States Army. I met a fellow who's a Christian scientist. I soon found out he wasn't neither one of them. He wasn't no Christian, uh, and he wasn't no scientist. Uh, he told me, he said, if you think you're hurt, it's all in your head. Uh, now, honey, come here, look at me. Look at me real good. Look at me real good. I might look like I come to tell a load of pumpkins, but I didn't. Amen. Did you ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Bless God, I did. It wasn't all in the head either, honey. It was my thumb that was hurting. He said, it's all in your head. And while I was in the army, I had a, had a toothache one day, and he said, it's all in your head. Uh, that made me upset. I said, listen, you ever hear the toothache anywhere else? Who ever heard the foot, a toothache in the foot? Who ever heard the toothache in the ankle? It's all in the head, huh? Yes, sir. Well, in those two years in the United States Army, I had to take a bath a few times. You know how it is in two years. I have to have a bath. I don't think the Lord meant to take but one a week. Do you all believe that? That's scriptural. You don't believe that? 
Well, read it. If God bid for man to take more than one bath a week, he'd made more sandwiches. All right. Listen. <laughs> I want to tell you right now, brother, listen. This guy's a Christian sign. He was taking a shower, and you fellas it has been in service, you know how they are. Got a big old room, bunch of showers, and this guy was in the first one. Now, I had to go through that shower to get in mine. I said, whoop, oh, turn it off, turn it off. Had the cold water on. Boy, that cold water hit my heart. I tell you, it was cold. He said, it's all in your head. And, uh, he said, if you think it's cold, it's cold. Uh, if you think it's hot, it's hot. And I want to tell you folks something. I'm a country fella. I raise, uh, kill hogs every year just about. I killed one the first week of January. We weighed 585 pounds. Uh, I kill hogs. I like good old tenderloin. Uh, I like ham meat. I like backbones and ribs. I like chitlins. Uh, I li- just name it. Hog, hog. I can eat it. That's right. I want to tell you, my friends, listen. Listen to me. Hot water. Are you listening? Hot water. Water makes hair come off a hog. I don't give a hoot if he's dead or alive. Amen. Hot water makes hair come off a hog. Next time you find one of these Christian scientists uh, that said it's all in your head, you catch him with his back turned. Get you a good hat pin. Have slip up on him and find out what the first could believe. You find out what kind of religion he's a practicing. Listen, my friends, this is a lying preacher. A lying preacher. Did you ever read about anything in the Bible concerning this matter? You remember when Paul the Apostle uh, came and he gave them the gospel and he said, Now listen, he said, if anybody else comes along preaching anything else, uh, even if an angel comes, uh, he said, let him be accursed. Uh, I want to tell you, my friends, tonight, listen, I bless God, the best thing in this world is to take the Bible for what it says. Believe it what it says. Uh, accept it as it is. Amen. I want you to know that tonight. Oh, listen, here is a, a lying preacher. Now, what happened? What happened? Look at verse 19. Here's a young man that's on the verge of being an Isaiah, a Jeremiah, Obadiah, Malachi. Here's a young man, my friends, that's on the verge of being a great preacher. But look at verse 19. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water, eating and drinking his fellowshipping. Is that right? Better watch who you fellowship with. Better watch who you run around with. Better watch who you listen to on television. Oh, you say, I'm, I'm strong in that crowd. You just keep a listening. Just keep a listening. And that crowd will get to you after a while. And the next thing you know, you will be saying, can you sing? <laughs> Boy, do I really like those songs he sings. Uh, and then the next thing, he'll have you go around, uh, my friends, and you'll be talking in tongues the next thing you know. Say amen right back. You say, I wouldn't have said that. What comes up, comes out. Amen. Uh, are you listening to me? Wake up, woman. Up that hey, I want to tell you, my friends, uh, that devil, that devil is shrewd. Uh, and so this man uh, goes back, he's eating and he's drinking. Uh, and the Bible said, my friends, he went back, he done exactly what God told him not to do. And now as he sits at the table, all of a sudden that old preacher rises up and he said, you've done wrong. God told you not to eat and drink. God told you not to come back. Said you disobeyed him at all points and said you'll never, you'll never get back to the sepulchres of your fathers. That is, you'll never get back where your dad and your grandpas are buried. And so he says to the boys, go saddle up the ass for him and let him go. So they did. I can see that preacher as he rides off. <laughs> and he says to the old prophet, well, I really enjoyed the good victuals you had. Oh, you got a good cook and that good drinking water. I've had some of the best drinking water I've had in my life. And he rides off and waves goodbye and said, if I'm ever back this way again, I'll stop by to see you. But as he goes down the way, listen to this, I'm going to hurry now. As he goes down the way, the Bible said a lion comes out of the thicket. And the Bible, listen to the terminology now, I'm going to deal with this in just a moment. Now listen to the terminology. The Bible said the lion came out and destroyed the man of God. Destroyed the man of God. Now then, look and let's, let's look at the scene. The Bible said here sits a lion. Anybody knows anything about a lion knows that he does not kill except when he's hungry. Now I'm talking about under ordinary circumstances. If you just get one hemmed up, or if it had little ones, or if it was injured, it'd kill you any time. But ordinarily a lion hunts my friends when it's hungry. What does it do? It devours. It eats the carcass. And then it lays down close by to guard the remaining part until it has devoured all of the carcass. But here sits a lion. 
and here lays a man of God in the road, and over here stands, we'll call him the mule, there he stands. Well, wait a minute, that's an unusual scene. The lion did not devour, it only destroyed the man of God. Who is the lion? The Bible said the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking to what? Devour. But he did not devour this man. What do you say? What do you say? I'm trying to tell you tonight, I don't believe the devil can devour one born again child of God. I don't believe that. I'll tell you what he can do, though. He can destroy you. Yes, he can. Now you get out here and you get involved. The devil can destroy your testimony. He can destroy your character. The devil, my friends, can destroy your morals, your character. Your principles, everything about you, he can do that. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Here lays a man in the road, a man of God. Here's the hindering force, the lion, the devil. But what about the, the, the mule that's standing here? Well, now, first of all, uh, that lion ordinarily would let that mule stand over there. And anybody that knows anything about a mule knows he wouldn't stand over there and a lion sitting over there. Is that right? No, sir. I mean, he'd be getting out of there. But I tell you, my friends, here's the hindering force, the lion. And who's been hindered? God's man. And my friends, why? Let's look at it for just a moment. How has God's man been hindered? I tell you, my friends, because he disobeyed the Lord. He went back on God. He went back the wrong way. God told him not to go back, not to eat and drink. And now then he has been destroyed. And he's laying in the way. Now you say, preacher, uh, is that man saved? Oh, yes, he's saved. You mean to tell me that uh, it turned him over to the lion, the devil, and, and he's still saved? Uh, yes, sir. Now, let me give you folks tonight a good verse of Scripture. For this crowd down on the job and everywhere else around here, that's always won't argue about once saved, always saved. That's their pet argument concerning Baptists. They always drag that one out. That's a good one. That's like uh, folks that don't go to church uh, half of the time. They always ask the preacher, I've got a question for you. Uh, uh, where did uh, Cain get his wife? I said, from his dead-in-law. Amen. Well, anyhow, you've always got that crowd that's got a question concerning once saved, always saved. Now, I'll tell you what, I refuse in life, my friends, to, uh, to be on the defensive end of anything. Bless God, I jump on the offensive side of it to start with. I mean, I get to show going. That's right. If you hang around me long enough, you'll find that out. I get to show going. Amen. And I think God's man ought to do that. Yes, sir. And let me tell you something, friend. I look here in the Scriptures, uh, and I want to give you a verse tonight to get that crowd of going. First Corinthians, turn to it. Don't go out here and lie on me tonight now. Turn to it and read it for yourself. First Corinthians 5, 5. When you see that crowd, you know what to believe. Uh, don't let them get started on you. Say, hey! i got a verse here in the Bible. I want you to explain this to me <laughs> and see what they say. All right, here it is, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. At the church at Corinth, there was a young man that was living with his daddy's wife, which was his stepmother. Watch it now. Paul the Apostle said, Turn such a one over to Satan. Uh-huh. He went to hell, didn't he? Oh, no. You didn't read the rest of it. Let's go on with it. Turn such a one over to Satan. For what? For the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Uh, now, get them to explain that, and I'll tell you what. I mean, they'll have to ride their bicycle off on that, honey. Amen. Yes, sir. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm trying to tell you tonight, my friends, there is a danger of you getting involved in sin. God turned you over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh, uh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You believe what I'm preaching? You believe that? Huh? That's right. I tell you, my friends, uh, let, me, let me give you another uh, something that comes along with that. Old Moses uh, went to God said, we need water. God said, go out and smite the rock and you get water. He went out and smote the rock got water. On another occasion, he needed water again. God said, go out this time and speak to the rock. Uh, he went out and looked around. Nobody was watching. Took his staff, smote the rock uh, two times. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Moses broke the true type. He's the only true man in the Word of God that ever broke a true type. Did you know, my friends, uh, uh, or 1,500 years later, it says this in the Bible, uh, and they followed that rock, and they drank of that rock, uh, and it says uh, that rock was Christ. Uh, that rock was to be smitten one time, uh, and from then on, uh, 
It's to be spoken to. Moses disobeyed God. All right. Notice, my friends, here. Uh, he said, turn such a one over to Satan uh, for the destruction of the flesh. Now, here's the man laying on the road. He's dead. He can't go. I mean, he, he's ruined. He's ruined. Uh, that's right. I remember one time I was in North Carolina in a meeting, and... Uh, I uh, told I preached Monday night Tuesday and I'd had to come home and I told the preacher I'll be back in time for services Wednesday night. And uh, so I got back after the service, went over to the pastor's house. He's sitting there in a, a rocking chair, rocking, looking at the floor. His wife was sitting there, she is a in a on the couch, she is looking at the floor. We sat there for five minutes, he didn't say a word. I said to him, Something matter? Uh, uh, did, did, did I say something I wasn't supposed to say? I'm bad at that. <laughs> bad at it. Huh? I said, Did I say something I wasn't supposed to say? Oh no. I said, Did I do something I wasn't supposed to do? Oh no. Well I said, What in the world's wrong? When he said, Listen, we've never had a full time evangelist in our church, and I don't know whether he's supposed to talk to him or not. I said, Well, I'm, I'm here to help anyway I can. And he said, it's that uh, organ player. Oh, boy, I said, can't she play that organ? Harold, you remember if, if, if one time, uh, you know, I bring the attention half the service, you don't remember. I said, well, can't she play it? Can't she? Well, she could play the organ, play the accordion, had a trio. My soul, they'd uh, make the hair stand on a dead man's head. But yeah, man, they'd get up and sing. I said, boy, can't she play that organ and sing? And I said, I see her uh, uh, coming down the aisle every night holding her, her husband's hand. Uh, he said, that ain't her husband. Oh, I said, it's not. No, said her husband's a little fellow sitting way back here on the right in the corner. Got on a leather jacket, a little bitty fella. Said, that's her husband. Said, now that guy come down the aisle. Said, he's a Baptist preacher. It's already tore up one home. And he's trying to tear this one up. And he said, Lord, we don't know what to do. I said, don't worry about it. Willie will take care of it tomorrow night. Amen. I went over to the meeting. I went over to the meeting here. They come down the aisle. I, I preached a message that night on hell and make a bench sin just about. And I mean, I was a preacher to them. When I gave the invitation, it looked like everybody in the church come to the altar except them. Yes, sir. I mean, all of us filled. People, about that time she jumped off of that tent, organ stool, ran down, grabbed that fellow by the hand, got a Bible. I thought, well, well they're going to get it right. But they didn't do it. They started working with people that's in the altar. I said, hold it! Right there. I saw me at the deacons of this church right now. We went over in a room, 14 of them. We went over in a room, and I said, Hey, would you fellas let me run a meeting here if you knew I was run by a crooked woman? Uh, boy, you should have heard that. It's like a beehive. <laughs> and finally they come up and said, No, sir. Well, I said, I'm going to run a meeting here, and that crook will play in that organ and run that preacher. I said, You either fire her tonight. Or I'm a going home tonight. And I'm going to give you three minutes to make your mind up. Boy, they went back that high. <laughs> and here they went. Finally, they come up again and said, we're going to let her go. They did. They hired her back to wait, but they let her go that night. About two o'clock in the morning, you should have heard this. You should have heard this. She is on the other end of the line. She rung that phone, and she wanted to talk to me. And when I said hello, she said, you. No, I said, you. Wasn't me. I'm going to tell you something. Now, Brother Clark's been preached long enough, and these preachers here have been preached long enough. I don't know what I'm telling the truth about tonight. Now, when a problem comes up in the church, and you have a big church fight and all this and that, when it all boils down, you know whose, trouble, whose fault it is? You! You don't want this what it is. It's you, buddy. Yes, sir! They'll say, hey, it ends up every time. And she said, you! No, I said, you! She said, you've ruined me. I said, I didn't ruin you. She said, I've got a talent to sing. I've got a talent to uh, play the musical instruments, and you've ruined me. I said, no, I said, your crooked living has forfeited your privileges to serve God and to live for the Lord. That's the that's problem tonight. Listen, here's this man laying in the road. You know what happened to him? I tell you, done wrong. And my friends, he forfeited his privilege to carry the gospel and the word of God. Now then, what about the mule? Let me give you this them through. The mule. What about the mule? Here's a way to go. Here's transportation. But you can't go when your life's ruined. I mean, look here, you get out here and you get in a uh, card game, get your leg shot off, and then all of a sudden you get saved. God don't stick a new leg on you. That's the consequences of sin. Is that right? Nod your head at me. Nothing else will help your neck. Come on. I mean, brother, listen. 
That's the consequences of sin. I mean, there's a lot of things that a person can do in life that's a consequences of sin. And you just have to bear the best you can, do the best you can, uh, trying to serve God and live for the Lord. Here's the way to go, but you can't go. And your testimony is ruined, and your life's ruined. And I tell you, I bring this solemn message tonight to your heart. And every young preacher in this building, don't get out of that oak. Don't sit down. Don't throw the flag in. Don't surrender. Don't give up. Don't stop. Take hold of the plow handles. Look straight ahead. Keep plowing. Praise God. Don't let anything bother you. Just keep plowing. You'll hit stumps. You older fellas, remember how you used to plow new ground? How an old pencil tail mule out there, and boy, I was hot and trying to plow that stuff. And about that time, that plow that hit an old stump or root in the ground, and I tell you, it felt like that whole plow went through my stomach just about. But honey, I just kept a plow. <laughs> Amen. And I'll tell you, since I've been saved, the grace of God, you think I've lived a perfect life? I'd be a fool to stand in this pulpit tonight and tell you that I've lived a perfect life since I've been saved. I've been married 38 years. Fellow ever said, you ever seen a flying saucer? I said, yes, and a few plates with it in 38 years, honey. Amen. That's right. Uh, hey, I'd be a fool to stand here and tell you that me and my wife never had a fuss. Well, you know better than that. And you say, did she go home to Mama? No. And I didn't go home to Daddy. You say, why? Because the fuss is too big and too good, and I want to stay and see how it's going to turn out. Amen. Yes, sir. Well, here's what I'm trying to say. Brother, if you've got a way to go, and you don't go, i got news for you tonight. There's the consequences God has to deal with us. Father, take the message. Use it for thy glory tonight. I pray if there's anyone in this building that's unsaved, as Brother Clark has already uh, made a plea and concerned about somebody in this building. Oh, God, it's a terrible thing to think about folks dying and going to hell when they could have been saved. Lord, they go to hell and look yonder in the land that's fairer than day and see Mama and Daddy and loved ones and friends, children, wife, husband, saved and know that you missed that. That's the most terrible thing I can think about tonight. Lord, if there's somebody in this house that's not saved, help them tonight to give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, may the Spirit of the Lord bring such pungent conviction to their hearts that this would be the night they surrender. Then if there's somebody here tonight, God, that's thinking about quitting on you, they're not going to be a deacon no more. They're not going to be a Sunday school teacher no more. <clears throat> they didn't found them a good place under the oak. They're going to sit down. They're going to rest a while. God, help them not to be foolish to not do that. But help us to labor together in these last days to get people saved with the grace of God. Lord, I don't know who's in this building tonight. I, I don't know the people's hearts, but you do. And I'm asking you in Jesus' name, touch the hearts of the unsaved, the backslidden. And then, Lord, for folks it's trying to live for you honest day by day, help us to move up to higher planes. Help us, Lord, as the song said, Lord, lift me up and let me stand on higher ground. Praise God, we want to go on, on with the Lord. Higher heights and, and greater depths with God. Help us, Lord, to honor you and serve you. Help us not to get in the highways and hedges and get destroyed by the devil. But God, help us tonight to labor for the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. Maybe somebody tonight in this closing service on this Wednesday night, God's dealt with your heart. Why don't you turn loose and come on tonight? Why don't you slip out of there? Praise God. Make your way to an altar. Settle it with the Lord.